a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee examined a bill titled the Postmark Prompt Payment Act. The legislation would require the postmark on an envelope to be proof of timely payment. It was introduced by Subcommittee Chairman John McHugh of New York. During this hour-long hearing, you'll hear from House lawmakers and Postal Service officials. As we proceed with the subcommittee's hearing on the legislation, H.R. 1963, the Postmark Prompt Payment Act of 1995. Uh, we will be hearing as witnesses from, as I mentioned, some of the co-sponsors, uh, as well as uh, other uh, uh, individuals who have expressed uh, an interest in this legislation. And in addition to my colleagues, I want to especially welcome talk show host Bruce Williams. As I'm sure most, if not all of you know, Mr. Williams is the host of a nationally syndicated radio show heard on approximately 400 radio stations nationwide. Uh, Mr. Williams' program is heard on TalkNet and is the country's longest running national talk radio program. And callers to the program frequently cite their experiences <coughs> with the payment due problem and the resulting late fees interest and credit record problems. I certainly want to give credit, speaking of credit, where credit is due. Uh, Mr. Williams was the originating force behind the idea contained in H.R. 1963. His inspiration for and support of this measure uh, has been invaluable and undoubtedly will aid H.R. 1963 gathering an even more broad base of support in the future. For the record, H.R. 1963 currently has 35 co-sponsors, including the chairman of this full committee, uh, Mr. Klinger, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, and indeed enjoys bipartisan support, support from both sides of the aisle. In addition to this distinguished group of witnesses, the subcommittee welcomes as well witness Mark Silvergeld. Mr. Silvergeld will testify on behalf of the Consumer, Consumers Union and Consumer Federation of America. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the subcommittee will not be hearing from invited witnesses who had previously made their opposition known to me personally, as well as uh, to the subcommittee staff. Uh, I truly regret that these invited witnesses chose not to testify before the subcommittee during today's proceeding. Uh, I want the record to show that this subcommittee made all efforts to include those interested parties in this legislative process uh, in an effort to try to be responsive uh, to uh, those uh, individuals and organizations concerns uh, I will order the record on this hearing to be maintained for uh, the next following seven uh, business days in which time they may submit written testimony uh, we have received some testimony already from the American Banking Association uh, as we walked in this morning, uh, for those of you who bothered to look, there was a, uh, what I would describe as a legislative memo being passed out uh, from uh, several credit card companies uh, who have expressed concern about it, uh, Visa and MasterCard, um, in opposition to 1963. If we receive this formally, we will make that part of the written record if there are representatives from that. Uh, interest uh, in the room this morning, I would urge you to formally submit your concerns uh, in writing. Uh, let me say uh, rather extemporaneously, I have read the testimony by the bankers. Uh, frankly, I think they raised some very legitimate points. And uh, again, I regret that uh, they were either unable or chose not to participate directly. I think truly their presence could have added in very important ways to the quality uh, of that hearing. That having, this hearing, that having been said, let me say that in my opinion, H.R. 1963 is sound legislation aimed at addressing a problem which most bill players, payers can claim experience. Quite often, conscientious people will dutifully pay their bills on a timely basis only to discover that they were assessed late fees and interest charges when the recording or receipt of their payment was delayed through no fault of their own. I know many of my colleagues have been approached by constituents relaying their problems with payments that have been mailed in a timely fashion and not delivered by the due date. H.R. Uh, 1963 is intended to address this problem. The bill mandates that the postmark on the envelope containing the payment will be proof of a timely admission. 
the uh, legislation applies to payments of a bill, invoice, or statement of any account due and only when made through the mail. It excludes metered mail. Furthermore, the envelope will have to be correctly addressed to the payee and have adequate postage affixed to it. The use of the postmark has precedence in contract law. For example, the Internal Revenue Service uses a postmark on the envelope as proof that a taxpayer had mailed their income tax return on or before the April 15th deadline, regardless of when the IRS received payment. Clearly, the intent behind this legislation is to protect conscientious consumers uh, who pay their bills, invoices, or accounts through the mail in a timely fashion. Some in the financial community have raised questions regarding H.R. 1963 and possible hardships it might impose on creditors who will be forced to preserve the postmarks on envelopes of late bill payers. I'm confident that these companies share my concerns regarding late fees, penalties, and adverse credit ratings being wrongly assessed against timely bill payers. Consequently, I would look forward to working with those uh, and as well as the co-sponsors uh, to uh, meet those concerns, um, which might uh, impact the intent of the legislation uh, and at the same time uh, reflect the concerns of those industries. Again, I, I welcome the witnesses here before the subcommittee and I uh, look forward to their testimony. At this time, as, uh, as I had mentioned, I would like to uh, recognize the presence of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, and ask him if he has any opening comments he might wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an opening statement, but in the case of brevity and move us along, I'd like to submit it for the record, but also uh, uh, I enjoy the, uh, I, I met Bruce Williams in Houston recently, and, uh, and I'm glad to know that uh, we can respond to not only his listeners, but our constituents. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me uh, uh, next, uh, recognizing the order in which I, uh, the chair saw them enter the room, uh, the gentleman from New York, uh, Major Owens, for any comments he might have. Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement which I shall submit, submit for the record. Uh, thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. McIntosh. I have no opening statement, Mr. Chairman. No. No. Also, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Earl. No statements. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we do have a number of uh, members of Congress who have uh, uh, joined in the co-sponsor of this legislation and leading off because I know he has his own uh, markup coming at 1030 is uh, my good friend, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bowler. Chair, Thank welcome. you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today to speak in favor of H.R. 1963, the Postmark Prompt Payment Act of 1995. I'll be brief because the case for this bill is so self-evident. This measure is very simple, yet very important. Each day, thousands of Americans charge everything from groceries to college tuition on their credit card. And each month, they send off a check in the mail to pay the bill without a second thought. Well, it may be the case that neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stay our faithful couriers from the swift accomplishments of their appointed duties. Mail has been known on occasion to be late and the penalties are severe. Huge interest payments and the possibility of a bad credit rating. That is very severe. Especially for younger families just starting out and for elderly people on fixed incomes, interest payments of 10, 15, or even 20% are harmful and unnecessary when the check was in the mail on time. This bill would rectify that situation by allowing the postmark on the envelope to be proof of timely payment. This measure would apply only to payment of bills, and the envelope must have the correct address and the postage affixed. The Internal Revenue Service already uses the postmark system, as you have observed, Mr. Chairman, and it works very well. Everybody is familiar with the countdown to the April 15th deadline. It's a winning proposition for consumers and creditors. The arguments and hassles over when the check was mailed will be solved, and those who use the old adage that the check is in the mail will have to actually live up to their word. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to compliment you for leading the way with this bill. I think it's very important legislation. Uh, as a fan of Bruce Williams myself, who often listens to him on TalkNet, I, I must admit I've heard him uh, espouse the merits of this proposal, 
and I compliment you for taking advantage of uh, his suggestion. And I would urge the subcommittee to have timely action on the bill. Right. Thank the gentleman, and again, appreciate his, his joining us here this morning, and, and thank him, at, uh, too, for his co-sponsorship of this legislation. Uh, we all recognize the busy schedules, but I'll ask the uh, subcommittee members if anyone has a question for our colleague. With that, thank, thank you very much. I've now been handed the correct order in which uh, we uh, notice the uh, members of Congress who have entered the room. Uh, I'm told that uh, the next uh, co-sponsor is the delegate from Puerto Rico, the Honorable Carlos Romero Barceló. Uh, well, the gentleman is indeed a gentleman, but uh, I go by what the staff said, so. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the, having the opportunity today to voice my support for H.R. 1963 and the Postmark Prompt Payment Act of 1995. And Mr. Chairman, you are to be commended for introducing this measure, and I was pleased to join with a number of members of the subcommittee in co-sponsoring your bill, because of a substantial majority of individuals who work hard to pay their bills in a timely manner, suffer from consequences that are not under their control. They receive a bill, they take, a, make, take note of the date that it's due, they write a check, and at the appropriate time they mail it, and that should be it. But unfortunately, despite all of their good intentions and actions, and through no fault of their own, numerous bill payers find themselves assessed late fees or interest charges because their payments were not delivered or credited in a timely manner. And if this has not happened to each of us at some point, it has certainly happened to someone that we know and some of our constituents. And once this happens to an individual several times, it begins to have a detrimental impact on one's credit rating. And in Puerto Rico, I must say that if the post office is bad in Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico is worse. It's the worst one in the nation, the post office. And from that time on, when you have your credit rating affected, the individual is ready to make a major purchase as a home or borrow, or buy a car or borrow some money, he is confronted with a major problem, one which the individual had nothing to do about it, and that's that his credit has been affected, and then he probably can't get the loan, or he has some penalized, or it takes much longer than, than it should have to get the loan. And the best argument in support of this measure is that H.R. 1963 is a narrowly drawn very, and a very sensible bill. It requires the payment to be properly addressed, carry adequate postage, and to be mailed in advance to the due date by then allowing the postmark on the envelope containing the payment to serve as proof that the payment was made in a timely manner, we're simply being fair and equitable to consumers. The measure does not seek to establish a totally new and elaborate system. It merely builds on the well-known existing IRS practice of recognizing the postmark on the envelope as proof that a taxpayer mailed his return on the, before the April 15th deadline, no matter what or when the IRS receives the return. This practice has functioned in a satisfactory manner for a number of years, and I believe a similar system for the payment of bills will work equally well. We're well beyond the days when one settled their accounts in person. This legislation seeks to correct a simple problem, but nevertheless a very real problem which can have substantial consequences and expenses for the individual involved. And many times he's at a loss. He has to argue and fight with uh, computers that they say the machine says, the record says, and sometimes they don't even have a person to speak to when they call, because there's a machine answering the, the phone call. Uh, therefore, I, I think this is a measure of great justice to our consumers. And I urge the subcommittee to favorably report the needed legislation at an early date. Thank well, you. Thank you, gentlemen. And th we have a growing number of members who have come here to make, uh, give testimony. And I'm very grateful. And if we get off on a lot of questions, we could be here all morning on that. But let me ask you just very quickly. As a delegate from Puerto Rico, you perhaps have a very unique situation as well. Uh, how often do your constituents actually have to mail payment to the states, or are all your transactions handled on the island of Puerto Rico itself? No, some of them have to be mailed to the states. Sometimes the, the main office of the credit card is sometimes is in, in the mainland, but it, uh, it should be no, no more time uh, to Puerto Rico than to Alaska or to Hawaii. Just a matter of uh, the fact, somehow, or other, the, there's never been enough money allotted to the Postal Service in Puerto Rico. That's mm -hmm. why the services at home are worse. 
shouldn't be any longer, but usually is. Yes. Yeah. And your your constituents pay that in late fees. Sometimes uh, it takes uh, seven days uh, for a letter to be delivered. Uh, that in those instances, you know, seven days is a lot of time for a letter, a payment letter. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Well, we thank the gentleman. I appreciate it very much. Uh, the next gentleman uh, is an is a individual who has uh, been in Congress for nearly 30 years. And in that time, he's only gotten better and uh, has been one of the leading advocates of uh, postal reform and issues that uh, involve uh, consumer uh, and relations in the Postal Service, uh, and I've worked with him on this initiative and a number of others, and I'm really delighted that he's not only co-sponsoring co this bill, but being with us uh, here this morning. Uh, Andy Jacobs, gentleman from uh, Indiana. Welcome, sir. I thank the chairman, and I return the encomium by uh, saying that uh, in Washington, uh, advocating common sense can be very hazardous, so I admire your courage. And I hope that in this uh, case it's successful. It's always awkward to argue in favor of the obvious, but sometimes because of extraneous factors it is necessary to do so. In constitutional law, uh, particularly in the case of criminal statutes, the scholars tell us that one of the most important criteria is certainty. And that is true of the law of contracts as well, I think. It is better to be a little off and certain that both parties understand the rules of the game and abide by them. Think how much litigation can be avoided. As a matter of fact, think how many wars could be avoided if human beings could accomplish certainty in their relations. Misunderstandings. Uh, Bill Malden did a cartoon once that said wars are impossible unless both sides are right. And uh, here, many times, you have in a contractual relationship both sides fervently believing they're right. Take the intersection accident with automobiles. You have two witnesses, one who swears the one person had the green light, the other who swears the other had the green light. And both are telling the truth as best they can. But what if you had a camera there? It would settle the matter. There never is a camera there. What if in conversation, uh, you agree with somebody else, uh, well, we'll do this, we'll meet at this corner, and then you go to different corners, and then you get a little fuss going. Uh, let's say it was of commercial significance. And you go to court. Now, if there had been a tape recording and somebody could play back that tape, that'd be about it. You'd know exactly what happened. Um, by some strange paradox, uh, uh, for several years, one of the largest banks in my city was my tenant, and the rent was due on the first day of the month. And it usually came straggling in around the 15th day of the month. And after that happened for about six months, I sent a uh, polite note saying that uh, if this continued, I would be forced to assess late charges and penalties. They began paying exactly on time. But the most important thing of all, as I say, is the certainty of it. The amount of money that can be saved in litigation. I don't know. There may be some interest, some creditor interest, who calculate in their bottom line what they can get from people in, uh, in penalties. Interest might make sense, but interest and penalties, that might be part of the profit picture. I don't know. It shouldn't be. What should be is good relations between the borrower the charger, whatever it might be, and the creditor. And this would straighten out a lot of uh, disagreements, save a lot of litigation, and as I say, it makes all the common sense in the world. I just hope that that common sense isn't too much of a handicap getting it through Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate his, uh, as always, lucid and commonsensical testimony. Any questions from the subcommittee? None. Thank you. Uh, we next have a uh, gentleman uh, from Wisconsin, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As uh, Mr. Jacobs was talking, I thought of my grandfather used to say that common sense isn't that common. Uh, so I hope that in this case it becomes common. I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning and test testify in support of H.R. 1963. Uh, your bill is an exercise in common sense at a time when we must begin 
when we must become more diligent in easing federal laws and regulations that confuse and complicate, this bill would alleviate some of the uncertainty involved in paying bills through the mail. If the payment of a bill is late, there are basically three possible causes of delay. The consumer could be late, the mails could be late, or the person who receives the, the bill could be late in processing it. With improved communication technology in recent years, consumers are more frequently sending their bill payments to addresses in other states. In Milwaukee, we send our phone bill payments to Columbus, Ohio. Ask 10 people where, they, where their credit card bills are sent, and you will likely hear 10 different states. The amount of time it takes for a piece of mail to travel from a consumer in one state to a business in another varies widely. Distance, weather, and a variety of other factors can slow the process down, resulting in a late arrival, even if the payment was sent several days ahead of time. By considering the postmark on the bill envelope proof of payment rather than the day the, the bill is received, this bill would prevent consumers' credit ratings from becoming victims of delays by the Postal Service. The bill would also protect consumers from late penalties due to slow processing of mail by companies receiving payments. Many large telecommunications companies and banks receive hundreds of thousands of payments every month. And if their employees do not record the receipt of payment from consumers in a timely manner, the consumers should not have to pay late fees. Using the postmark for the effective date of payment would shield the consumer from overdue penalties resulting from inefficient processing of incoming mail. H.R. 1963 does not infringe on the right of fair-minded businesses to charge late fees or interest payments when appropriate. Consumers would still be responsible for paying their bills promptly, and any disputes over whether a payment was sent on time could be answered by simply checking the envelope containing the check. As you have noted, Mr. Chairman, there is ample precedent for using the postmark date as the date of payment. The IRS requires that income tax returns be postmarked no later than April 15th. This method has a proven record of effectiveness and could be extended to the private sector with great success. Mr. Chairman, your bill offers a promise of honest and simplified dealings between businesses and consumers. These days, honest consumers who pay their bills on time have enough to worry about while trying to ma maintain a good credit rating. So let's not miss the opportunity to make things a little easier for the people we represent. Thank you. I mean, thank the gentleman. Thank him for his common sense in uh, helping to advance this initiative. We appreciate his co-sponsorship. There's no questions. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stockman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Morning, How are Steve. you? Very well. Well, I, I'm not going to, I don't have a prepared statement. I'm just going to speak to you from my heart. As a uh, congressman for only 10 months, a very shortly before that, I was a consumer. And during our campaign, uh, we ran up credit card debt. And I have to tell you that this uh, legislation is, is more about common sense and individuals. And I'm, I'm very proud that you've taken a leadership role in this because I believe that this sends a signal that we do care about the consumer. So often, I think, as we're discussing today on different issues, it looks like we forget where we came from and that we ourselves no longer remember. But 11 months ago, I was a consumer, and I, too, experienced personally some of the uh, things where you write out your check, and they either lose it. In fact, I actually experienced with my student loan. I hope this applies also to the student loan program. Um, and, and I was assessed a late fee. And, and this is something uh, not to my fault, but, but really to the fault of, of either uh, mentioned earlier, the fault of their processing or the fault of uh, late mail. So it's, it's something I think that uh, Congress needs to do, and I don't understand why it hasn't uh, been already in effect, and it's long overdue. And I appreciate your leadership in this and, and your uh, commodity to the rest of our members to speak on behalf of this. But 1963 should have been done in 1963. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we thank you, Steve, for coming, and again, appreciate your your help in, in leading the fight for this uh, piece of legislation. We look forward to working with you. Thank that. you very thank much. You. And to my good friend who pushed this, we're, we, we still listen to him late at night on the radio in Houston, Texas. Many of us do. Not in Houston, but in other places. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Peter Blue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of, of the committee. I'd like to commend you and the members of this committee for addressing what I think is a major problem in the area of consumer debt. That is the problem of late payments, which may be no fault of the consumer. As you know, most people in the country have some sort of consumer debt where they pay interest rates of as much as 21% on insurance, 
credit cards, home improvement loans, and auto loans. It is a necessary evil in most people's lives. And hopefully, this year, the Congress will go to great lengths to bring us a balanced budget, which hopefully will reduce those interest rates on American consumers. Recently, I leased a new car, which requires me to make a monthly payment for the next two years by a date certain. If I fail to make that payment on time, I am charged a penalty. Needless to say, I am very diligent about paying my loan on time to avoid paying more than I already do. However, a little-known practice in the financial services community adds an additional burden to consumers for actions that are often beyond their control. Banks which offer grace periods generally charge interest on a monthly payment if it is not paid on time. What this means is that if an individual mails a payment with a week to spare, but the payment is delayed by circumstances beyond his or her control, the individual is charged extra. In essence, they can be charged extra due to circumstances that they had nothing to do with. A quick survey of banks and credit unions in this area and my home state of Massachusetts revealed a consensus. While the terms varied from bank to bank, all charge consumers extra if a monthly payment for a credit card is not received on time. In Massachusetts, one of the largest banks, Bay Bank, charges interest for every day the payment is late. Closer to home for many people who work in the House of Representatives, the Wright-Patman Federal Credit Union charges interest retroactively. This means that if a payment is just one day late, Wright-Patman will charge interest for the days late plus the grace period. This practice can, can cost consumers more than money, though. It can also cost them a good credit rating. Late payments are noted on everyone's credit re record, whether it is the fault of the individual or not. Enough of these late payments can tip the balance against a family applying for a mortgage, auto loan, or student loan. Fortunately, though, my good friend from New York and the members of this committee have proposed a solution. This legislation, the Prompt Payment Act of 1995, would ch change the status quo in favor of the consumer. It would require that a payment be considered on time if it is postmarked by the due date. This means that the bank, post office, insurance company, or other institution cannot cause an individual's payments to be late and thus cause a charge or black mark on his or her credit rating. This legislation has been endorsed by companies in my district who say my business depends on the mail being used to carry bills and payments. Furthermore, they call it an important milestone. The American consumers deserve this protection, and indeed the IRS affords it for the purpose of paying taxes. This precedent should be followed by financial institutions. As a co-sponsor of H.R. 1963, I want to congratulate the gentleman from New York and the members of this committee for finally addressing this issue and giving the people of America a chance to feel more secure with their financial system. I urge the chairman to speed this bill through the legislative process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Blute. And let me note for the record that uh, when we reached out for support and co-sponsorship, uh, you were one of the very first to indicate your willingness to, to join this fight, and we appreciate that uh, thank you, early Mr. and strong indication. Uh, that. Uh, concludes the members who have uh, indicated an interest to testify uh, who are co-sponsors of the legislation, uh, which moves us now to the uh, second phase of our hearings. Uh, we will call up uh, first Mr. Mark Silvergeld, who is a co-director of the Washington Office of Consumers Union. Uh, Mr. Silvergeld, it may not make a lot of sense, but under the House rules, members of Congress who testify before subcommittees are not required to swear an oath, but uh, all others should. Perhaps we should rethink that as well, but uh, as you've risen. Raising your right hand, you promised the uh, testimony about the uh, render of the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. The record will show that the uh, witness... Uh, attested in the affirmative to the oath. Uh, Mr. Silvergel, welcome again uh, before this subcommittee. It's good to see you, and we appreciate your being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I compliment the chair and the co-sponsors for um, introducing and promoting uh, this legislation, which um, I am pleased to uh, endorse on uh, behalf both of Consumers Union of the United States, Inc., which is the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports, but also on behalf of Consumer Federation of America, of which I serve as a vice president. Uh, CFA is the uh, largest coalition of uh, consumer organizations uh, in the United States. Mr. Chairman, it's um, quite clear, and I agree with uh, the members who testified uh, just before me, that this is a um, common sense 
uh, solution to a very real problem for consumers. Um, I can't provide the quantity of uh, evidence uh, that Mr. Williams uh, will pr provide, um, uh, but my testimony also has um, uh, some examples of why uh, this legislation uh, is uh, needed and appropriate. Um, I asked uh, via our intra-organizational email for um, some examples uh, from our own employees and added my own, and those are capsulized in my testimony. Uh, uh, whether it's the uh, cable operator who posts the bill as paid two days after the paid um, date stamped on the back of the check uh, by the uh, consumer who paid the bill. In that case, that's my own experience. Uh, or the um, uh, person who has a mortgage in California, live, uh, mortgage owed to a uh, mortgage company in California, lives in New York, and finds that it's potluck uh, from one month to the next, whether or not mailing on the same day uh, gets it there on time uh, each month, and some months that date will get him a late payment, and some months it will get the mail there on time, um, or uh, whether it's um, uh, the occasional uh, consumer who says, uh, uh, as one, ex one uh, fellow employee, an employee told me, in August 1995, my payments to several credit card and charge card customers, um, creditors, he meant to say, were all posted 10 to 15 working days later than normal. Normally it has been about three days after I mail it. Um, or whether it's any one of the hundreds of uh, uh, consumers who have complained, uh, there is a problem. I noted today in this morning's Baltimore Sun, uh, and I suspect that it's also in the um, post, an ad by the U.S. Postal Service um, talking about its on-time performance. Uh, in my home city of Baltimore, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, um, uh, Postmaster General Runyon um, uh, informs the public in this ad, uh, mail is delivered on time 81% of the time. That means that one in five uh, letters, uh, and I assume that means one in five bills, is received late. That is to say, not on time, uh, not within the uh, standard time, um, provided um, uh, by the Postal Service standards. That's a lot of late bills. Uh, and that's a lot of problems for consumers. Now, some creditors are going to tell you that there are some problems with this bill. And I agree that this is not a free lunch, um, that uh, there will be some costs uh, and some inconveniences and some changes necessary in the way business is done uh, in order to accommodate the provisions of this bill. But given a large bank or Joe Smith, I guess that's not such an unusual name anymore, uh, given fortunes of Maryland basketball last year, uh, who has to deal uh, with the consequences of the mail taking several days to get across town or um, uh, more than the allotted uh, amount of time to cross the country. Uh, the question is who should pay for it? And I think the common sense answer is that um, the uh, larger business institution uh, needs to make the adjustments that are necessary, factor it into its costs so that we all pay some tiny share of whatever additional costs there may be, and there will be uh, some, um, but probably not as much as um, uh, some of the opponents of the bill will suggest. Um, instead of having those who have the misfortune of living in a poor performance postal area, um, or uh, simply that the random chance of ha dealing with um, uh, the post office box that isn't emptied for several days. Uh, there's a footnote in my testimony that describes um, such an incident. Uh, pay uh, the larger amount involved in additional interest and or late fees. And so uh, we're happy to um, uh, support this solution to the problem. Perhaps one of the effects, one of the um, uh, external effects of this solution may be um, that the business community will uh, put more pressure on the Postal Service in their local area uh, to deal with uh, delivery in a more timely manner. Um, that would be a, uh, a welcome added effect uh, to this legislation. Um, there are some arguments I'm sure you will hear. Um, I, I too uh, am uh, sorry that uh, the uh, 
people who object to this uh, chose not to testify today, you will hear some objections. Uh, uh, some will say that uh, creditors already waive late charges if it's well explained. Well, it seems to me that uh, uh, dealing on the phone with um, uh, the customer may not be the most efficient or the most equitable day, uh, way to assure that everybody who has the problem is dealt with equally. Um, that some charges must be rescinded. Well, yes, uh, if, if postmarks are received long after, after the next bill um, is, uh, the, after the billing cycle ends and the bill has been uh, uh, printed and sent to the customer, there will have to be some uh, late charges rescinded. Um, I would point out that, um, uh, as they indicate, they're ready to do that on a case-by-case -case basis now, and they probably do it, uh, that uh, retail uh, creditors do that all the time with uh, returns uh, and defective, merchan other, uh, defective merchandise and other returns. And uh, there are other ways to deal with that as well. I know, for instance, that while my American Express Optima card says that it's due on the 27th of the month, when I called this summer to find out how I could make two payments because I was going to be on vacation for a month, uh, I was told that actually it wasn't posted until the second of the month. So there's, there is some lead time that they've built in. Um, the May department stores uh, tell you not what your due date is, but what your mail-by date is, and leave a cushion uh, there so that um, uh, they can guesstimate uh, what that lead time is is necessary to get the payments due. There are a number of options uh, that uh, creditors can have to try and minimize the costs uh, that will be uh, uh, the result uh, of this provision. Um, but um, it seems to me that uh, given the choice of having some costs and putting those costs on the consumer or regularizing them as, as a cost of doing business, uh, that um, it, it's more equitable to place that um, uh, cost on the business rather than the consumer. I would point out also that this isn't just for consumers. As I read the bill, this applies to businesses too, so that while I have to pay um, uh, the person who comes and fixes my plate glass window and my 10-year-old and his friends uh, put a soccer ball through it, um, that person has to pay the wholesaler plate glass and that wholesaler has to pay somebody in Pittsburgh or wherever who manufactures plate glass. Many of them mail uh, their payments by mail too, and they're going to get the same uh, advantage, and I'm sure that some of them have the same kinds of problems. Uh, this is um, uh, good for consumers. I think that uh, uh, it's only fair that it, uh, businesses get the advantage of uh, the provisions. I would do note several um, things about the draft of the bill, Mr. Chairman, that I would recommend um, uh, that you take a look at. I think that um, it needs to be absolutely clear that this includes um, the language of, uh, of the bill that defines coverage uh, applies to fixed loan payment coupons since consumers, uh, I think they fit into the language, but um, it's not absolutely clear. And um, consumers of um, uh, loans for automobiles and mor mortgages especially um, typically would get a uh, fixed, fixed payment mortgages, would get a coupon book at the beginning of the uh, credit transaction and then no notices from the uh, uh, company other than a late charge uh, if that occurred. Uh, throughout the course of uh, the remaining course of uh, the credit relationship. So we want to be sure, I would think, that uh, that's covered. Um, the date of crediting the account, the bill refers to the date of receipt, but it doesn't refer to the date of crediting. Now, for transactions that are covered by truth in lending, um, there is a provision in the truth in lending uh, implementing regulations, uh, Regulation Z, uh, that says that uh, the creditor shall uh, promptly uh, credit the account on the date of receipt unless no late payment uh, occurs. So this uh, provision working in tandem with the Truth and Lending Act uh, would in fact um, uh, provide the intended effect. But there are many transactions that I read the bill to cover that would not necessarily be um, Truth and Lending uh, uh, transactions. Um, uh, my cable bill example, for instance, I don't have, have the right to pay my cable bill in installments. It's due in full every month. That's not covered by the Truth in Lending Act, and so you would need to uh, uh, reword, reword the bill slightly to assure that the payment is actually credited rather than simply deemed received. Um, and finally, Mr. Chairman, I would um, uh, suggest that regulation writing authority not be given to the USPS, but rather be given to the Federal Reserve System 
um, with instructions that they write the regulations in consultation with the USPS and the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and um, in consulting with um, uh, the, those agencies, you may find that the other reg uh, depository regulatory agencies should also be consulted. The reason is very simple. Um, USPS has no uh, experience in the consumer credit area, no experience uh, um, in writing this kind of regulation. Uh, regulations in the consumer credit area have pretty uniformly been given to the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, it has that experience. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the, the um, Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Trade Commission, and the deposit, other depository regulators uh, enforce those. Those are the agencies with the experience, and I think that it would be preferable to have the Fed write those regulations. I would also note, as the Chairman well knows, that um, under the Revenue Foregone Reform Act, um, there was quite a bit of trouble in getting the USPS to write regulations that reflected the intent of the statutory language. Um, and for that reason as well, uh, I would urge that the Fed be uh, charged with writing these regulations. Mr. Chairman, I'd close by once again thanking the Chair and the co-sponsors uh, for uh, sponsoring this important uh, piece of legislation. I believe that it will do consumers a great deal of good uh, and urge the subcommittee um, uh, to uh, uh, move this legislation forward. Thank right. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Silvergill. Let me, let me just note uh, that we have uh, been joined by the distinguished uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Barbara Rose Collins. Welcome. Uh, any opening comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Uh, because I believe that uh, H.R. 1963 is um, badly needed, Bill. Uh, I'm just sorry I didn't think of it before you did. No, I didn't think and, <laughs> and I, I think that uh, perhaps we need to take um, the suggestion Mr. Silbergel, did I pronounce that right, uh, put in his written testimony that not only should it be considered, payment should be considered received as of the postmark date, but posted also on that date so that late fees don't occur. Um, I, th I don't think there's hardly anyone in this room who has not had a problem with a, a bill not being um, paid on time because of the uh, them receiving it late, even though it was postmarked earlier. So I commend you for the bill. Well, and thank I, you for your testimony. I thank the gentlelady. And while we're talking about truth and lending, let's have truth in government. I regrettably have to say I didn't think of the bill, but uh, we're all working together. We will hear from the really the thought father of the bill in, in a few moments, but I uh, appreciate uh, the distinguished ranking member's comments and look forward to working with her and, and agree that, Mr. Silvergeld, uh, you've made some very helpful suggestions and we'll have the subcommittee look at uh, the text of the bill to try to see how we might uh, integrate them. Uh, let, me, let me just start off with a couple of questions. Uh, and let me restate, I, I, I really regret that we weren't able to bring in some of those who have concerns about this bill. I mentioned in my opening statement that the American Bankers Association has prepared written testimony. We will make that a part of the record. And frankly, they make some excellent points. And we're losing an opportunity, in my view, to discuss that with them uh, in this forum. But nevertheless, let me just pose two of the issues that, that they raise that, for your comments. They say, number one, that in most instances, insofar as they are concerned, uh, you already have a bill in grace period. Example, a mortgage payment. Uh, all of us on our fixed payment coupons that you mentioned see a due date, say the first of the month, and then a, a late date after which the late payment is assessed, let's say the 15th, whatever it may be. They claim that that is a grace period provided outside the conditions of the contract. And that, indeed, if this bill were put into place, it would, it would necessarily follow that they and others would have to eliminate that grace period, uh, they would say, to the detriment of the consumer. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I don't um, necessarily read the bill that way, but that could easily be fixed. Um, uh, there is a footnote in my testimony that cites the regulation uh, Z provision. Um, with respect, which does apply to them, by the way. Uh, so I don't see why, why that, this bill would have a different effect. 
and it says that it shall be deemed received on the date of the postmark um, unless no late payment is received. So it, it is in, imposed. So if they choose not to um, uh, impose the late payment or if they are required not to impose the late payment, um, then uh, I don't see, see why that has any effect whatever on the uh, grace period. I, I do not read this bill as telling them they must um, charge a late charge uh, if uh, uh, that postmark is after uh, the um, uh, due date and, or, or, or the, the um, uh, le legally, uh, the contractual date. And the, the, the bill can very sim simply be uh, uh, revised to allow them to do that. I think what they're suggesting, again, because they, they did, chose not to appear, or couldn't perhaps, uh, in the short period of time that they were provided, I think what they're saying is they're, they're not so concerned that the technical language of the bill would prohibit them from doing that currently, but rather the reality, the impact of the bill would be they could no longer provide or would no longer provide that voluntary two-week roughly uh, float period from the time the payment is actually due to the time <coughs> beyond that point in which they begin to assess the late charge. In other words, that two-week period that most of us see on our mortgage payment coupon would disappear. And they would say that would be to the detriment of the, of the consumer. Therefore, we're really, by implementing this and, and seizing that, what Congressman uh, Andy Jacobs called certainty, that I think is important, by seizing that, we'd actually be harming the consumer. Well, we, we, we would actually, in order to do a quantitative um, measurement, have to look not only at... Um, those creditors, but everyone else uh, to whom consumers uh, uh, typically pay uh, their uh, obligations by mail and uh, see what the total cost is because uh, those banks are not the only uh, uh, creditors. I'm using creditor in the broader sense, not in the truth and lending sense, uh, to whom consumer, with whom consumers have this problem. Uh, there may be some losses. My, my snap judgment is that there are... Um, larger offsetting gains. Uh, I'm also not certain that uh, uh, we have a two-week float with everybody, uh, we consumers as a whole have a two-week float with anybody, to just anybody and everybody to whom we pay our mortgage payments. Uh, so you would say then, for the record, that uh, th th that question of certainty, that knowing as a consumer that you post your payment in a timely fashion is worth whatever theoretical loss of float may occur. Uh, and unless I see some quantitative measures uh, to the contrary, I would say that that would be the solution I would uh, accept. Okay. Let me ask you something else in your position as an expert. They, we've also received from other folks the concern that there's really little basis for this in contract law and that indeed what we have in this bill is an unnecessary intrusion of government into what are by essentially and in fact private contracts between two willing voluntarily entering uh, adults. Uh, as someone who is part of this 104th Congress that wants to get government out of people's lives, how might you respond to that uh, statement? Of well, that's sort of an argument for a free-for-all um, marketplace, Mr. Chairman, and I don't think that uh, wh whether one believes in more regulation or less regulation that um, uh, most of us believe in no regulation whatsoever, and uh, um, I note, for instance, that the Congress, in the process of revising the Truth and Lending Act, and after a um, uh, number of battles in both banking committees, um, uh, a compromise has been reached that is far short of repeal. Uh, I, I believe that it took Paul Douglas, uh, the original sponsor of the Truth and Lending Act, 20 years to overcome the opposition of creditors to... Uh, such things as having everybody calculate and disclose the annual percentage rate the same way, and I don't think there's a member of the Congress now who would want to change that provision and go back to uh, uh, the jungle of non-comparable uh, credit rate disclosures. Um, any provision can be argued as the last straw, the one too many, but I think this one is common sense, and I don't think it's that, it is not that regulation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would... I don't want to dominate this. I would yield to the uh, gentlelady from Michigan. Any questions? Yeah. 
Uh, I'm vice chairman of Sanford, South Carolina. You're back, uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Gentleman, gentleman from New York, Major Owens. You've said it all. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank My you very pleasure. much, Mr. Silvergill. I mentioned earlier we would soon hear from the individual who really, more than any other, is responsible for the genesis, is the genesis of this legislation. And I'm pleased to call uh, forward to the witness table Mr. Bruce Williams. Let me, before you sit down, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, do you swear the testimony you're about to present is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. The record will show that the witness testified, uh, responded affirmatively to the oath. And let me again welcome you, Mr. Williams. I feel a little formal because everyone around here, if you say the word newt, everyone knows who you're talking about. Yes, indeed. And uh, for those of us that drive after the sun goes down in our cars <coughs> over large chunks of territory in our districts, the word Bruce uh, conjures up that same familiarity. Uh, I feel as though I've known you for years and years and years, and let me, as a, as a fan, say thank you for the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of common sense that you bring to the airwaves and helping people. We appreciate that, and I think we have in this legislation that you have brought to our attention uh, the latest example of that uh, exercise of common sense, and we appreciate particularly uh, you're coming up from the sunny climes of Florida to the uh, nation's capital to uh, present your views on this. And we welcome you and uh, would now give you the uh, uh, forum and the dais for any comments you'd like to make. Thank you for your generosity and the generosity of your remarks. It's appreciated. Uh, I will spare you the introduction in that you've introduced me and why I don't think there's any reason to go through my bona fides again. I'm in the radio business, I'm an entertainer, it's simple as that. But Mr. Chairman, I would commend you for introducing H.R. 1963. And I express my sincere appreciation for having the opportunity to appear here. You and the 35 co-sponsors of the bill have shown the American people your resolve to remedy a problem that I believe plagues millions of Americans. At a point in history when so many Americans question the commitment of their government, you and the co-sponsors of H.R. 1963, you're sending a message, a message that democracy does work for the people. But legislation is truly a grassroots initiative. It worked its way into the legislative process. It's not a product of any special interest group. No highly paid lobbyist, lobbyist is promoting this legislation. The bill had its genesis where much good legislation does in the public. H.R. 63 addresses a concern reflected in my conversations with many people over the last few years. During the course of a week, I do have the opportunity to speak to some several millions of people. Now, not so many years ago, <clears throat> if you borrowed the money for an automobile, took out a mortgage, or some other type of consumer loan, the overwhelming likelihood is you did it in your own neighborhood. And when it came time for the monthly payment, you strolled down to the bank, the loan officer, whatever, you dropped off your check. That was the end of it. That's the way it was. Today, you can take out a mortgage on Tuesday, and by Thursday afternoon, the mortgage is sold to a company two, 3,000 miles away. Now, the company has no personal knowledge of you, and understandably, they wish to be paid. The problem is getting the payment to them on a specified due date. Now, under most current contracts, the obligation is not considered met in a timely fashion until the check is in the lender's hands. Now, while that was appropriate when you could drop it off at the office or depend on the U.S. mail to deliver it the following day, neither is the case today. In the first instance, your loan may be payable across the nation. The second, the post office, to say the least, is less efficient than it once was. Let's follow the federal model currently in place. When we pay our income tax, the postmark on the envelope is demonstration of timely payment, hence the rush on the 15th of April. If it works for the U.S. government, as well as some states, my home state of Florida accepts taxes paid by the postmark, not by when they receive it, why not do the same thing? Metered mail, of course, would not be accepted for obvious reasons. If the sender so desires, FedEx, FedEx, United Parcel, and similar services should be accepted as payment on time if put in their hands on time. You see, under the current system, if the check is delayed in the mail, the debtor is penalized with late charges and, 
As noted before, his credit record can be damaged through absolutely no fault of his or her own. He or she may have posted the letter a week, 10 days early, but for whatever reasons, the letter gets there a couple of days late. Not only are they penalized with late charges, but on top of this, their credit reputation may be damaged. Of course, this is a lever that many companies will use to extract the late charges, i.e., we will damage your credit. And we all know many folks would rather sacrifice their firstborn child than have a poor credit record. In addition, there is a temptation for some lenders not to pick up their mail on the last day. Again, if the mail only reaches them on the following day, they're in a position to extract late charges from their customers, charges that are unwarranted. I can't begin to tell you how many complaints I've listened to about this. Clearly, if a creditor makes a sufficient fuss and reaches a sympathetic officer, at times the charges can and will be waived. But this places a premium on persistence and negotiating abilities, or put another way, the less gifted are then penalized. I'm suggesting legislation that would require the lenders across our country to uniformly accept the postmark as the appropriate payment on time. Now, it could be argued that sending the letter certified mail would work, but it doesn't. That only proves the letter got mailed. There is nothing binding about the postmark. The suggestion is simple. In order for the lender to be entitled to a late charge, he'd be required to provide a photocopy of the payment envelope. And I would like to uh, go a little bit away from my prepared remarks. I note in the American Bankers Association uh, petition, for lack of a better term, they address this. And while they do make, as you've pointed out, some interesting points, I'm embarrassed because I am a part of institutions that belong to this inst the agency that they make comments such as they've made here without a little more thought in depth. As an example, uh, they say with, they, with no way they could sort these things out and whatever. Well, most of the obligations that I have, and perhaps that you folks have, they put an envelope in, a return mailed envelope. Well, if the envelope is provided to you, it would be a simple matter to put a barcode in for the different dates the thing is due. It would be spit right out by their automatic sorting machine, or it could be color-coded or some other way identified. It would not be a hard thing to overcome technologically. And further, they go on to say, uh, supporters of the bill allege, without documentary evidence, that unscrupulous creditors deliberately delay creating an account on the, the crediting account on the day, payment date in order to receive charges. And then they went on to note that under Section 164 of the Truth of Lending Act and so on and so forth, they must post payments of receipt. Well, that answers the question. I apologize. All you have to do is pass a regulation. I have to believe in every one of those towns where these banks are located, they have a law that says you can't rob a bank. So we can get rid of all the security people in those banks. We have a regulation against that. I mean, that's nonsense to say there's a regulation, therefore the problem is cured. Uh, and I will talk about that in just a moment. But let me. I mean, I think that's just such a specious argument. It's, it's embarrassing that a major institution would make it. Well, I've mentioned this idea in my program. I've invited listeners to comment, and the evidence is, what? <laughs> my goodness, somebody hijacked my postcard. Oh, OK. There are several thousand postcards. I don't know how many. I think the last told me, told me something, four or 5,000. I think every section of the country, certainly all 50 states, uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, the Virgins, all are included, because this is the area where my show goes. Uh, and that was just with a few mentions on the show. I think if we really wanted to stir things up, more people would respond. And understand something, too. If you say something negative, you get tons of mail. To get people to respond to a positive action is far more difficult. And I'm sure you fellows and gals have found that in your legislative lives. People respond to the negative far more easily than the positive. Now, there can be some objections, clearly. And let me anticipate a couple. The first, the additional paperwork involved. Well, the alternative is to liberalize their policy and not to attempt the late fee, or alternatively, accept the inconvenience. A second argument that can be forward is the loss of the float. Now, it should be noted that no lender, to my knowledge, gives credit when you make a payment early. If you're going on vacation, you send your check in three weeks early. I've never received a, che uh, a check from them or a credit saying, well, we got your money early, so we're going to forgive the interest for that three weeks. The next time that happens will be the first time. Put another way, if they're entitled to a fee when payment is made late, why shouldn't the creditor receive the same amount of interest if the payment is received early? And interestingly, it's been brought to my attention by bankers that when they send interest payments out, rather than crediting to account, for example, on a certificate of deposit, it is mailed the day the interest is finished earning. 
And if you ask them, well, gee, it took a week to get here. Well, that's not our problem. We postmarked it on time. And you can test that theory. That is the way the banks operate in today's business climate. Seems to me the old goose and gander thing would apply here. Now, some of my critics have said something to the effect that you guys in the media are anti-business. Now, I can talk in theoretical terms, but let me note the following. I have an active interest in a Visa MasterCard program where I promote the use of particular institutions' credit cards. I am paid on the basis of profitability and interchange. I get a piece of the action. Clearly, if I felt this was to the bank's detriment, I'd think about this again. Additionally, I have what for me is a fairly large investment in six figures in the stock of a relatively small bank. And further, I've pledged an additional six-figure investment in a bank that's currently organizing. Clearly, I'm not anti-bank. And further, I've been in the radio business for 20 years, but I've been an entrepreneur all of my adult life, and I operate businesses in, I think, about six states. Might be five. I looked at that. I'm not sure if it's five or six, but at least five. The legislation, if adopted, will simply level the playing field and clearly spell out the ground rules. And right now, the ground rules are by whatever any institution decides they should be. And finally, if the federal model is a poor one, then it occurs to me two things should be happening very quickly now that this has been brought to the attention of the Congress. First, public spirit organizations like the Bankers Association, like Visa and MasterCard, should spend at least part of their resources petitioning you to change the federal model, change the internal revenue system, because if it's a bad business, Clearly, it's their responsibility to point that out. And secondly, if a legislator feels this is bad business, I certainly think he or she should go on record as endorsing the federal model change. Now, clearly, my tongue is firmly in my cheek because I believe this is good business. It's good for everyone involved. In 14 years uh, on the network, with the exception of I do uh, an IRS special every year, and that's on a weekend, I have never had a guest. I have tur turned down a great many congresspeople, senators, and representatives, and a couple of seated presidents, and Bob Hope. Uh, no guests on my show. I don't want the camel to get his nose under my tent. It's just me and the audience. That's it. No guests. I will take, clearly, telephone calls. So I'm inviting, and I will invite on the air and by mail, the folks that didn't come here today, I'd like to meet them, who were opposed to this, I will give them a special telephone number so they can get right through. They don't have to sort through our screening process. And I'll allow them to present their views on the air. There's however many, 15 million people, whatever the number is. Now, that will get their point of view out. Now, I suspect that some of their customers might not be real happy with that. But we're going to find out. But I, I always give people a shot at me if I criticize someone. I have never on any occasion denied them the right to shoot back on my show. And I think that's necessary here. So I'm issuing a public invitation now, and I will do so this evening on the program. And further, I'm going to read extracts of, of their presentations on the air. Because I said when I mentioned this on the show, both sides should be allowed to comment. I think that's appropriate. Nobody's perfect. But I like to face them. I really enjoy that. I thank you very, very much for your graciousness and allowing me to appear this evening. Well, uh, Mr. Williams, thank you for being here. All of the buzzers that you've heard and the beepers going off is that we have been called for a series of votes. And uh, I know of your busy schedule. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, when we leave for the vote, uh, we, we will not come back because it will be such a long period of time. Uh, I do want to say that... Uh, with unanimous consent, without objection, we have statements from Congressman uh, King, Representative Walsh, and Davis to be included uh, in the record. And as I said, we'll keep the record open until the close of business on October 20th. But let me note, uh, if there's any doubt about the, uh, uh, I think, very responsible attitude of the good people who wrote Mr. Williams and, and flushing through them, we found a penny postcard in which uh, this particular person expressed his interest in this bill. And it's, it's interesting to note that the penny postcard uh, was used in the United States from 1873 to 1917 and has not been in use since then. And this person kept this postcard and properly uh, posted it uh, to mail to you. So you've got some very frugal and evidently some very healthy and long-living uh, listeners. Maybe a testimony to the demographics of my program. <laughs> I think that's only partly it. But uh, uh, we, 
we do, October 27th, the record will be kept open. But we do appreciate your being here. Uh, I will note that uh, the majority of members of the subcommittee have joined in co-sponsorship of this legislation, which I think shows uh, my colleagues' dedication to this. As, and I know, as you heard, as the members came in, in rather significant numbers to testify in support of this, there's widespread and bipartisan interest. And we look forward to working with you in pursuing this very important legislation. I would uh, say to any of my colleagues for any comments or quick questions they might have. Chairman, just again to welcome Bruce and, and also that constituent or your, uh, your listener who sent that lowered the value of that uh, postcard <laughs> by putting it in the U.S. mail since it was from so old. But I'm glad they're dedicated. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, we will be working with you, and again, uh, all of us appreciate your support and effort. Thank you very much, Mr. With Chairman. With that, we will uh, recess, adjourn. It's undetermined whether there'll be more hearings on this bill. According to the subcommittee, there's no timetable for bringing this legislation to the congressional floor. The House returns today at 5 p.m. No legislative business is expected until next week unless a budget agreement is reached. The partial shutdown of the government has lasted 12 days. 250,000 federal workers remain furloughed.